So here's the picture that started to develop for me. This is a famous photograph taken of the, at 2.33 p.m., July 24th, 1908, on the East Lawn of Windsor Castle, the Fourth Olympia, the Olympic Marathon. And Fred Simpson is that man right there. He got the pole position. He went to England with the Canadian team in June, and he spent about six weeks in London, trained in, in the city. And Tom Longo didn't go with the Canadian team. He stayed back. He had won the Boston Marathon in 1907. He was already famous. So he, his, his uh, manager, Tom Flanagan, took Tom uh, individually to Ireland to train. And so it was Simpson that became the person of interest in London because he was dished off that. And that was a real, uh, just that itself, that a North American Indian would be here trying to win a gold medal was fascinating for the people in London. So fortunate for Simpson, because he was doing so well in training leading up to the marathon, he got the pole position. Now well, this photograph, now Tom Marble is right, right there, you can't see Longboat, you can see the back of his head. Prime Minister Harper did, wrote a recent book on amateur sport and hockey in Canada, and he, he identified Tom Longboat uh, wrongly. I think he identified him back here, but this, this start of this race is on YouTube, and Fred Simpson runs by the camera. It's about a six second clip, and Longboat is to his back of his left, over his left shoulder. I'll tell you another story about this. Uh, when I was, so I was so interested in the Olympic history and the Olympic marathon because of Simpson. In 1976, when the Olympics came to Montreal, uh, CBC televised one hour documentaries on the history of the Olympic Games. And so there was a one hour piece on the decathlon, a one hour piece on the marathon, etc. On the marathon, I remember um, being fascinated by that. Fast forward to 1991, I think. I'm in Winnipeg by that time. I go to a jumbo video one night to rent a movie. <laughs> I see that documentary on VHS, so I rent it. And I take it home. And there he is. I've now captured his story. I understand his story so much better by that time. I see him run by the camera. And I'm blown away. So I kept the movie for a couple of days. They were following me. Late I took it back. And then I arranged with a buddy at the university. I wanted him to take that VHS and freeze frame it down for me. I went back to rent it, and it was gone. So anyway, I searched high and low and pleaded with these people to bring it, put it back on the shelf. So I rented it, but this time I kept it up for three weeks. And I was getting late fees climbing up. And anyway, buddy freeze frame that, broke it down for me. And, uh, and now, you can go on YouTube and you can find the same clip. But anyway, the fascination is simply in this photograph. I remember this photograph from being a child. And uh, it's the, the Olympic marathon, the 1908 Olympic Games were the first Olympic Games to be filmed, for one. And there was a commissioned phot photographer who took some great classic photographs of, of the game. Just a little comment. He would stay, stay at way back here, where, you know, where uh, the store, general store in Rose D is. He would stand there and he'd tell the guys, you go way up there, like maybe up to uh, 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 where uh, the crows live, he says, and I'll raise you. And he'd, he'd give them time to go, and they'd get there, and then he'd raise. And he'd be past them in no time, <laughs> further on down the route, eh? Just, just things that they would do, eh? Yeah. Here's another photograph I found after the fact, years after the fact. This is Fred Simpson running through the streets of London, um, number 64. He was unidentified in that photograph, but through my research and knowing what number he was, etc., and knowing the way he ran, that's, that's Fred Simpson. The, the guy behind him is Johnny, Johnny Hayes, who eventually won the gold medal. So he is the, uh, he's the, the linchpin. His early stories and the interest of the race caused me to ask, where did his name come from? 
It's English, it's not Mishnabat. Who were his parents? Who were his grandparents? His great grandparents? Did he live in a home like me? Did he experience parental love? Did he hunt? Did he speak Ojibwe? Did he trap? Why did he work as a laborer? Did he harvest wild rice? Who was this man that in a short period of time, from 1906 to 1908, gained recognition as one of the best long distance runners in Canada? And on July 24, 1908, he claimed the title of the sixth best distance runner in the world. Wow. There's another classic photo. That's actually when he was a professional. Um, so, trying to answer these questions raised so many more about Alderville as he grew older. So I inherited the cause, I believe, through his story, and trying to answer the multitude of other questions raised by it, about the Mississauga Nation, the Bay of Quinney, Great Island, the military treaties, the Indian Act, the Ojibwe language, the church, and the creation of the Alderville Reserve. Um, so, he's the window. I'm not going to concentrate on him. He's the window that I look through. But as I married, I made a presentation to the church last year, and Mary said something to me. She said he would bring over moldy cakes to us when they lived on the East Reserve. I still remember those cakes, and I enjoyed moldy cakes right and that's so interesting. It just, it's just stuck with me. And I was, uh, I was sitting with King Crow um, not too long ago, and King said was talking about him because King is uh, 87 now, and King remembers him vividly. And King said to me, "I remember when he would come into the house up here, and he'd take his shoes off at the fire, and he'd smoke his pipe. He didn't inhale." But he smoked his, I forget what kind of tobacco he smoked. But he said, uh, King said, I just like to smell that tobacco. And he said he never inhaled. It was just a reward for a man's hard day's work was to come in and have a few puffs on his, on his pipe. And I thought, I just, I could envision that. And so I drove to Akron in June to visit with my Uncle King to just pick his brain a little further about that, that reference. So anyway, the point being is that we all have something that interests us in life, you know, we become auto mechanics or hairdressers or PSWs or, or you name it. We become something because we take an interest. Well, I looked at Fred Simpson, he's my hero. He's a child hero, still my hero, and uh, he's been the one that's been an anchor for me um, in this community, helping me understand more about the community. Um, and I should just say one more thing. I asked, I asked myself, did he have parents? Did they love him? All those simple questions. Well, you know, his dad died when he was five years old. His father drowned in Rice Lake in 1883. And his mother died. He was born in 1878. His mother was dead by 1891. So he was raised by his grandmother. And King told me, he said, you know, he always kind of bounced around from house to house. He never really had a family per se. Well, his dad died at five years old and his mother was dead before he was 12 years old. And he was raised by his grandmother. And Uncle Jack told me in 1984, Uncle Jack said, he was never much of a crackerjack of a trapper. <laughs> and you know why? Because his father died when he was a young boy. He was a great rice gatherer, great wicked shot with a 22, but he was not a trapper. So he didn't have that fatherly training out in the trapping grounds because his, he lost his dad. And his dad drowned in Rice Lake, so fast forward, you know, he was never cracking jack of the trapper because he lost his father, I'm sure. So anyway, he's, he's the window. Now back to Alderville. Uh, so Alderville, First Nation Indian Reserve, was first survey, they call it the Indian Settlement, Alamuk Indian Settlement, uh, was first surveyed in 1835 and situated in the former Alamuk Township, south of Rice Lake, in what was known as the Newcastle District, formerly the Home District, which was constituted by Northumberland and Europe counties between 1798 and 1849. 
The relocation to the new community of Aldersville, as it was originally named, included the Mississauga Ojibwe groups residing around and back of the Bay Quinney and Kingston Gananoque area. It was the Mississauga and the Chippewa that along with the Six Nations had helped defend the British interests around Lake Ontario frontier during the American Revolution and the War of 1812. So history and oral tradition has taught us that the, uh, taught us the one interpretation that the Mississauga Ojibwe Anishinaabek came south to present-day southern Ontario around the end of the 17th century through struggles with the Iroquois for control of the region's rich hunting and fishing grounds. These struggles drove the latter back, these struggles drove the Iroquois back south across Lake Ontario, and eventual peace allowed both to quote, unquote, overturn the war camps. The other tradition held by some people within our communities Doug Williams, for instance, tells us that they had already been here, that the, the Anishinaabe of Mississauga had already been here, and were returning back to take possession over present-day southern Ontario. So throughout the 18th century, the 1700s, um, it's the Mississauga who were firmly embedded in southern Ontario, and so the early treaties that transformed the lands around the Bay and Upper St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario frontier were amongst the Mississauga and not the Iroquois. This is just a little perk that I tell my boys, that they are descendants of those warriors, because the warriors stayed here after the battle with the Iroquois. They are descendants of those warriors that had them. Yeah. Yeah. All our, our ancestors yeah, that's right. were descendants of these people. Yeah. Um, so this is a really complex history, and Sherry being a teacher, you know, this is really, really complex stuff, and it's been poorly, it's not taught well, I shouldn't say poorly, it's not taught well, it hasn't been taught well, uh, because it wasn't important generally, but this area, this area is one of the most important areas in the history of Eastern North America. What happened in this area of su uh, Southern Ontario, um, one of the most important, some of the most important events took place in this area here, amongst the Iroquois, the French, uh, the Anishinaabe, who were you know the Great Lakes tribes. Um, it's I, you know they create history courses, uh, university courses, four years long to try to teach this stuff, um, but. One of the things that's interesting that I'm finding out is that the gems of history and the documents reside in the French language, in the French archives. And most American, for instance, historians have only drawn on the British archives. And Canadian historians have largely drawn on the British archives. Well, there's historians who, like Gilles Havard, who is a great historian, a French historian, who went to Paris and drew on the French archives because he could read French. And that is where the gems, of, that's where the real story, that's where a lot of the untold story lies in the French archives. Because our people, the Nishinaabe, they were allied with the French. They weren't allied with the English. They were allied with the French. So if you want to know what the French and our people were doing, you got to go to the French archives. Now this fellow, Gilles Havard, for instance, he wrote the first edition in French. Then it had to be translated. So then you've got to, you've got to have good translators who don't lose what he was saying in French into the English translation. And so, so much can be lost just in that piece alone is in translation. And trying to understand what these French people were saying and writing, just that alone in old language from the 17th century. People wrote differently, they talked differently. So the challenge facing historians interested in First Nations history is really, really difficult and really, really complex. So this whole story, this whole notion that uh, the Mississauga came down and drove the Iroquois across Lake Ontario, uh, that's a simple story. That's a simple interpretation of what happened. It really didn't happen that easily. There was a lot of jousting and a lot of 
uh, warfare. There was the British and the English had their own interests. And so there was decades of almost peace between our people and the Iroquois. The Five Nations were the primary movers and shakers out of New York. And so there's a whole period between 1650 and 1700 where there's peace, there's warfare, there's a whole multitude of tribes. Uh, the Mississauga, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, you name it, there's 40, 50 different tribes that are at war or in alliance with each other. So trying to break that out and trying to put that in its proper historical place is a real, real difficult challenge. So I really, my hat's off to these historians who are doing that work. Um, so our people were firmly, became firmly embedded in this area after the great peace of Montreal of 1701. There's no historians that know about the Great Peace. Very, very few know about the Great Peace of Montreal. Uh, the Nanfan Treaty. There's no academics that don't know about the Nanfan Treaty. It predates what they were studying. It predates the English side of the story. The Great Peace of Montreal was a treaty between the Iroquois, the French, and the allies of the French who were part of who were our people, and that brought peace to Eastern North America. And what it did is it saw the Iroquois go back to the south side of Rice Lake, into their homeland in New York State. And that's how the Mississauga come into this, in this area and take possession, so that by the time the British are here, in the 1763, 1760, it's the Mississauga nation that they are now aware as possession, undisputed possession over this Lake Ontario frontier. Um, so the French and the British, we've learned about the Seven Years' War, or they call it the French and Indian War in the United States, and the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, we probably all learned about that. Uh, and we might have heard about the Royal Proclamation. Our people that spoke here in 1923, some of those old men, they knew what the Royal Proclamation was. The Royal Proclamation was put down by the British. What it did is it rearranged and reconstituted the administration of the possessions that the British had won from the French during the Seven Year, Years' Wars. Um, and the Royal Proclamation is an important part of Canadian constitutional history because in the Royal Proclamation it said where we don't require land for settlement, it remains the Indian hunting ground. So it's viewed as the Magna Carta of Aboriginal rights. It's the first constitutional document that says where we don't need land, it remains Indian land. And the Royal Proclamation is very, very important in Canadian constitutional history, legal history. And there's another thing that we very, very few of us know about regarding the Royal Proclamation is the plan for the future management of Indian Affairs in North America that came out of the Royal Proclamation process. And that plan had 43 articles. And what it did was it set out the relations between the colonists, the British, and the First Nations. And again, it, and it even went into further detail about how those Indian lands would be negotiated for when settlement was required to move into a certain area. So what it did is it established the treaty process. The Royal Proclamation and the future plan established the treaty process. So while on the one hand it said that will remain Indian land, on the other hand it established the process to take that Indian land. Um, this is the first Abominable Act, they call it. The second was the 1774 Quebec Act, which extended the boundaries of the Royal Proclamation and that led to the American Revolution. Um, so, even though the British put down a plan on how to treat with the, the First Nations, they screwed it right up right from the beginning. Um, when, after the American Revolution, 1783, the United Empire Loyalists, we've probably heard a little bit about the United Empire Loyalists, the UELs in our, in our history, um, Britain, Great Britain had to find a place to resettle its loyalist settlers. And about 50,000 were moved into the British colonies, British North America. 
which existed in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Quebec. And so where did they come looking? To Prince Edward County in the Bay of Quinney. It was one of the first locations where they moved settlers in. And so they had to treat for those labs with our people. And they were originally the British. William Crawford was an officer. He came looking and knocking on the door of the Mohawks. And he was reminded, you better go talk to the Mississaugas. You have to talk to the Mississaugas. You just can't treat with the Mohawks. In fact, you can't treat with the Mohawks. You have to treat with the Mississauga. And so Crawford uh, created a treaty, quote unquote, called the Crawford Purchase. The Crawford Purchases. And the Crawford Purchase that we are concerned about runs from the Trent River through the Bay of Quinty over to Gatanoque then back um, as far as a man could travel on foot in one day. That's pretty ridiculous. And one man might travel far, farther than another man. Was it raining? Um, was it night? No, it was day. Um, was the man a big man? Was he a small man? If we, if 25 men in this room walked to Coburg, we're not all going to get there at the same time. So it's a pretty harebrained way to uh, negotiate the treaty. There was no description of the treaty. There was no written description of the treaty put down. So it contravened the Royal Proclamation, the Crawford Purchase. Um, and here starts the dispossession of the Mississauga lands along Lake Ontario. Today, uh, it's through our modern and le present legal and specific claims process that we have gained a better understanding of the land that we maintain interest in at the Bay of Quinty. The whitewashed version of history taught us basically that at Grape Island, beginning in 1826, we left those interests behind. We came out of the light and into the darkness and embraced a new way of life. This couldn't be further from the truth. The Grape Island interpretation is but one view and it never gave voice to the much richer history involving our people going back and forth. Great Island. A few very uh, notable academics have written about our people, such as Donald Smith, but the main theme always touches on the Great Island story. As mentioned, in order to, pr to prove our interests in the land through the modern claims process, the historical work coming out of that process is much more complex, viewed from a very different perspective, and it shows that while Christianity made inroads in the lives of the people, in fact, they never gave up their efforts to maintain their interests in the land, and they never gave up their interpretations of the early treaties. So here's a, a map. Now this map is just relatively new. This map comes out of our legal process. We're now in federal court. We're at the trial division. Uh, regarding the Williams Treaty. So we're paying a lot of money to be in court. Uh, but out of that process, we get a new historical spin, if you will, on our place in the Bay of Quinney. This is a map produced by David Crothers, one of the best map makers in Canada, and Michael Toms. Michael Toms is our historian who is uh, defending our history in federal court right now. And this is a map that was produced and introduced to the court just in the last year. And so this would be Trent River down here, Trenton. In Belleville area here, Grape Island is actually in there, but in 1783, Grape Island was, was not uh, considered. Uh, the Methodist mission wasn't considered yet. Um, so these red pieces of land are the pieces of land, points, islands, that our people said they had never given up, that they reserved. So when you read the sanitized version, the Grape Island version of our history, this isn't mentioned. This is not mentioned that we had any interests in the Bay of Quinty. But when you uh, hire expert witnesses and historians, um, who delve into this for years, this is what we've come out and this is what we've presented to the court. The 
This is another map. Uh, so Crawford was 1783. This is the gunshot in the Toronto Purchase. The gunshot treaty goes from that boundary at Trenton, today present day Trent River, Trenton, and it goes west and it covers the areas of Brighton, Presque Coburg, Grafton, Port Hope, and back up to Rice Lake. And the Gunshot Treaty was another harebrained treaty. As far as the sound of a gun could be heard, shot from the shore of the lake. Was it a cloudy day? What kind of a gun was it? There's so many variables that come into play when you start talking about treaty making like this. And the Toronto Purchase is 1787, and that is, it takes in all of Toronto today. And the Toronto Purchase was actually a claim, that another claim that went through the specific claims process that was just settled by the new credit First Nation uh, about three years ago, to the tune of about $145 million or 154, one or the other. So, this map, there was never a, a description put down in, uh, originally when the uh, gunshot <coughs> treaty was negotiated, and the gunshot treaty will factor in 150 years, 140 years later, during 1923. So as the frontier grew into Upper Canada, so Upper Canada was created in 1791 because by that time there were upwards of over 10,000 settlers that had come into this area. Uh, the colony of Upper Canada was created in 1791. Um, these treaties, Crawford, Gunshot, and the Toronto Purchase opened up land to bring settlers in. Um, well, one, one of the religious groups that followed the frontier were the Methodists, American Methodists, the Episcopal Methodists. And these guys were tough uh, horse riding preachers and they followed the opening of the frontier. And this is the first, this is the group that first came into contact with the Mississauga along the Lake Ontario frontier. So from the early treaties, 1783, 87, uh, into this period of uh, um, the, 17, the 1820s, our people have complained about settlers pouring soap into the Credit River and affecting the spawn. Uh, our people uh, have complained about settlers running timber down the Trent River and destroying the, the spawning beds. Uh, so there's been complaints for, the, for a, a number of years about encroachment. Um, one of the early reserves, and I don't mean reserve in the sense that we live on a reserve, but some of the early reserves that came out of the early treaties were to protect the fisheries. And the Credit River was protected by, uh, established as a reserve for the Credit Mississauga, 16 Mile Creek. And there was a 428 acre Indian burying ground reserve that was set aside, which is now present day Belleville. And, uh, but as soon as those reserves were put down, the encroachments began so that our people couldn't protect them against settlement. Um, so 1806, as uh, early as 1806, one of the credit Mississauga chiefs is complaining about soap being dumped in the credit river and it falls on deaf ears. So um, um, the, the culture, the ability to fish and hunt in the regular places, uh, the regular uh, sites along Lake Ontario became village sites. Um, at the Moria River, for instance, as soon as you put a mill in a river, it totally changes the ecology. Uh, it totally turns the whole ecology and the whole activity of gathering upside down. So while settlement came in and while they were, while the settlers were doing their thing, it, it had the complete opposite effect against the traditional economy of the Mississaugas. So the life, life becomes very dismal for the people and is probably best reflected in the 1818 treaty, uh, which is the Rice Lake Purchase, which is Cortha Lakes today, 
um, in which the young chief complained basically that we, we, we relied on the farmers to help us, we relied on the settlers to help us, but we get chased off, we get our dogs shot, we get chased away, and that wasn't the original understanding of the treaties. The understanding of the early treaties was that they were uh, sharing uh, agreements where the Indians would keep the wetlands and the white settlers would take the highland because the wetlands were like the grocery store for the First Nations. And But you see that where these weren't written down, where these understandings weren't written down, there was nothing to defend. So it's a real, real peak period of early Canadian history. So the people, they reach out to Methodism uh, as early as 1823 in a desperate hope to survive in the face of settlement. And um, so they reach out at Ancaster, the west end of Lake Ontario, Peter Jones, a famous name even amongst our own people, Peter Jones. John Sunday takes uh, Christianity, converts in 1826. Peter Jacobs converts in 1825 at Belleville. And uh, John Sunday is one of the most famous stories in Canada. Uh, he was quite a fascinating man. Um, so he took Christianity, converted in 1826, and so I'm always careful to be mindful of those decisions. It's, thanks, John. It's too easy to say, it's too easy, you can't, uh, I can't, criticize John Sunday or our people for converting to Christianity because I'll never know how bleak it was that we'll never know how bleak that must have been. To see the wave of history and the wave of settlement erode your harvesting sites, and your burying grounds, we'll never know what that was like. So they reached out in the hopes that Christianity would save them from extinction and from extermination. Um, some of them took English names in some cases. Uh, John Sunday, Shoandis was his Nishnabad name, became John Sunday. Ponta um, Jaga was Peter Jacobs, he became Peter Jacobs. I think maybe that was just a fanatical twist on his <laughs> traditional name. Um, uh, George Cockaway. Um, none of these fellows took English names in the case of Simpson, English name, um, and others didn't go that route, but the general sort of uh, point is that the, the Methodists were very, very influential in starting to change the identity and the names of our people. So in 1826, the Methodists established a mission on Great Island, 10 Acre Island, some of you have been there, um, 1987, some of you were probably down there, and uh, 10 Acre Island. Um, which again is sort of harebrained when you think about it. Um, if you sit on the shore of Lake or the Bay of Quinty in November when it's raining and the winter winds are starting to blow in, you must think, what did our people think? They wouldn't have been in the Bay of Quinty in November and December. They would have been back behind in the, in the backland. Um, so it must have been really, it was culture shock. It would have been culture shock for our people to have been living on an island, a 10 acre, 10 acre island. Uh, it, it is said that at its height, there was enough people there that there were 20 people per acre. That's a lot of people. Um, and so the, the Great Island Mission, it was established as a model taken from the Credit River Mission. And the people learned how to, they learned basic uh, carpentry, arithmetic, how to raise animals, and. Uh, the impracticability of Grape Island is they had to sow their crops on another island. They had to pasture their sheep and their cattle on another island. I don't think a farmer today would find that very practical in trying to, uh, to operate a farm. Uh, but, but, but the Grape Island mission is really, uh, it's just a small little piece of our history, but it's fascinating what occurred at Grape Island. So Great Island became known as the Mecca of Indian missions in Canada. And under the tutelage of Reverend William Case, whose picture sits, lie, uh, sits over in the, the church on the wall, on the east wall, 
Uh, he took, he teaches his flock to build homes and a school and sow crops, read English and wake up at 5 a.m. to bow to a bell, pray, eat, study, work, pray, eat, sleep, and awake and do it all over again. It would have been somewhat like being at boot camp. Um, it was culture shock, behavior modification. It was a process of civilization. To the historian today, while it's a fascinating period of early white Ojibwe relations, the underlying efforts at assimilation in so many varying ways throughout the 19th century, from Grape Island onward, are in some cases simply mind-boggling and harebrained. As a result of the inadequate land base, the leaders of the Mississaugas of the Bay petitioned and were eventually encouraged to find land elsewhere, and that elsewhere became Rice Lake. As early as 1830, the process of seeking out an alternate relocation took place. The troubling part of this is the rapid pace of encroachment that had swept over their lands at the bay in the first place, with not much attention being paid to their attachment to the land. So again, in the early, in the, the Indian histories of Great Bottom, it doesn't even touch on our people's interest in the land. They never lost their interest. And I mean their interest in a legal sense. Their, claims to, the, to those pieces of land at the bay. They never lost sight of that, and they never lost the knowledge around those parcels of land that they, in their own minds, um, said that they had retained. Uh, eventually at Oliveville, the Ojibwe language, so the fascinating thing about Great Wilder, one very, very fascinating, fascinating thing about Great Wilder is that people like John Sunday and Peter Jones and John Jones, Peter's brother, um, what they did is they learned how to read and write English in a relatively fast period of time. Not, uh, not all of them did. Not everybody that came to Great Island uh, believed in its mission. They left. Some of them left. Uh, but what these early fellows did is they believed that this is our way to, remit, to avoid extinction. And what they did uh, at Great Bowden is they used the English alphabet and they created the written Ojibwe language. And so we are so used to seeing the written Ojibwe today, we can identify that now. And we see, we take Ojibwe lessons and it's written on the board. And that comes out of, in part, comes out of Great Bowden. And it's fascinating how those, the effort that was put into creating, taking all the fanatical fanatics and turning it into a written language. It's phenomenal. Uh, and so in, 18, in the 1828, another fellow, James Evans, uh, English Methodist missionary, he tried to create a syllabic out of the Ojibwe language, but he mastered the Cree syllabic in Norway House by 1841, and we should possibly be familiar with the syllabic. Uh, that's those funny little symbols that you see. That's uh, a, that's the written form of Cree. And now the syllabic today is used in Inuit communities. Uh, there's different dialects that are used, written, um, used using the Cree syllabic. But that was an English missionary who took the existing 250 shorthand languages operating in England and created a written syllabic. In our area, it was the English alphabet that was used to take and create the written Ojibwe. Quite a fascinating advancement. And actually, it could be threatening to, to the government for Nishtaba or Cree to be able to write and then petition the government in their own language. That was a threat. And so that's why in Norway House, for instance, it took five years before the Cree could get a printing press brought into the trading post because the Hudson Bay Company viewed it as a threat that the Cree should be able to learn how to write. So, but eventually, by the 1850s and 40s, there's an Indian problem. The government doesn't want to keep paying for Indians. It doesn't want to keep honoring the treaties through the giving of presents and annuities, it wants to assimilate the Indians and get rid of that Indian problem. And 
So when you see that in 1830 the Ojibwe language was used to uh, help our people, well, it was the basic the basic objective was to use the Ojibwe language to convert Indians. Uh, but when you see that it's employed in those terms, and then fast forward 15, 20 years, and now it becomes an impediment. The Ojibwe language becomes an impediment to the Christianization of the young people. So that in the 1850s, uh, after the Alderville Industrial School is built, which is a predecessor to the residential school, the Ojibwe language becomes a barrier to assimilation. It becomes a barrier to Christianization, to civilization. So in the 1850s, John Sunday, who was so hopeful that education policy would help the people be able to protect the land. He wanted a title deed for all of Peter Jones, John Sunday, they wanted a title deed to protect the land. Thanks, John. This is a great shot of John Sunday here. 1828, he was ahead of his time. He wanted a title deed for all of them. He wanted a title deed for the lands that had uh, not being taken over. And by the time they came to Alderville, he wanted a title deed for the Alderville Reserve so that the government could erode and remove the people from the land. So really important thinking that this man uh, possessed. Uh, and the fact that by, 18, by the late 1830s, he could write Ojibwe, and him and Peter Jones, for instance, could write to each other in Ojibwe. Uh, it was almost like a code. So really, fascinating man. To this, to this day, we don't have a title deed for all of them. So I'm shaking his head over there. No, we, don't, we, don't have, we don't hold our land in fee simple like, uh, like somebody off the reserve. And so 100 and whatever, 90, 180 years ago, John Sunday, he wanted that for our people. So, um, so this this whole notion that there's an Indian problem leads to one of the first royal commissions called the Baggage Commission in which Indians are studied and they've been studied ever since, inside out, upside down, by a number of royal commissions. The Baggage Commission said we need to establish uh, schools so that the kids can leave their parents because their parents are the ones holding them back and they can come to the school and learn how to be farmers, uh, domestic servants, and they can learn how to read and write, etc., etc. And they would also provide some of the labor to run the farm uh, that was attached to the school. So the original Oliveville Industrial School was out front where the band office is. And it, the cornerstone was laid in 1849. By 1858, John Sunday is complaining that it's a failure. This has failed us that the school and the education policies are failing us. So he was dismally disappointed by 1858 that the Alderville Industrial School had failed at what it was supposed to do. Uh, there was also typhus uh, that was going around, affecting, killing children and people, and so the Industrial School, by 1861 at least, was closed down, shut down, and it was a failure actually. And the other Industrial School that was established at Muncie continued, and even some of our people uh, ended up going to Muncie. Um, so schools were, were man mandated to help Ojibwe of Upper Canada and later Ontario make the jump to the sedentary and agrarian-based economy. The message was clear, leave your culture behind, discard the ways of your parents, come off the land and learn the way of the dominant society. The process of educating the Mississauga and the Ojibwe brethren is highly documented, so we can find a lot of information about this process. Okay, the uh, industrial school. The school was funded by the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society and also by a portion of our annuities. And whatever tribe sent their children here, they would send a quarter of their annuities to help sustain the school. Um, okay, are we so okay? Uh -huh. Here's a quote from Sunday that I was just talking about. 
We were promised great things when it was first started, the school. And being desirous to see our children well educated, we willingly consented to give the fourth of our annuity for its supply. But we have been sadly disappointed. Well, that's a pretty stark comment about his feelings on the Alderville Industrial School. So, in reading Canadian history, the Mississauga, in my view, have little to be content with when it comes to the impacts of such historical moments in Canada's responsible government, Confederation, and the Indian Act. While these events fortified Canada, they undermined the Mississauga place in the same Canada. So today, we press, continue to press our historic claims. Um, Thurlow, I mentioned one of the earlier reserves that was established at the Bay of Quinney at Belleville, 428 acre reserve, the Indian burying ground. Um, the government came looking to surrender that land in 1811. It was formally surrendered in 1816. There was no proof that we were paid, and so in the 2000s, we pressed a claim, and I think it was 2010, we negotiated this specific claim, and it was settled between Canada and ourselves. Um, and I think it was 734,000. It's a, a very small, specific claim. Something that came out of that, I won't bore you too much longer here, something that came out of that, Canada is, is ruthless. I don't know what America, the United States, is like when it comes to First Nations. They don't have a very good history either, sorry. But Canada is ruthless. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the things that came out of the Thurlow Agreement was that we would write a plaque, we would have a celebration, and we would put a plaque down at the waterfront at the Myers Pier. And you know, we could have had a parade, I guess. We could have had anything. We decided we we're going to have a celebration and a plaque unveiling. And um, so nothing really moved too fast. And so I wrote a first pass at this plaque. And I know from my experience how many words go on a plaque. You know, like a normal historical plaque. I'm pretty familiar with how many words go on these plaques. So I wrote uh, some text related to Thurlow that would fit on the plaque. And I used the term loyalist refugees. So the people that came into Belleville, the, the uh, Prince Edward County, Bay of Quinney were loyalists, but a number of them were true refugees. Uh, the Quakers, for instance, who came in around Hay Bay, they were refugees, they were pacifists. They didn't take up arms during the American Revolution, so they were scared to stay in America, so they left. Um, the Six Nations who had fought against the Americans on the British side, uh, they knew very well, we're not going to have much chance trying to survive here in the new United States of America. So they left, and they were established at the Grand River, also at Tyananega. So there were, and the term refugees is still used depending on who's writing the history. However, I used the term loyalist refugees that came to the Bay of Quinney. One of these mandarins from Ottawa that tried to write their own text called, said that the loyalists were returning to the Bay of Quinney. I said, no, they weren't. There was no such thing as loyalists before the American Revolution. How could they be returning? I don't know who this person was. Anyway, <laughs> uh, nothing really happened. Nothing really happened. They didn't like what I wrote. And they didn't like the term loyalist refugees. And because um, Canada, it took them two months to fess up to what their problem was. It took them two months to officially say, because the people of Belleville might take offense to that term. I said, are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> if you go across to Hay Bay, uh, I think you'll, you could determine that there were true refugees that came to Hay Bay as loyalists, uh, the Six Nations. Um, so we bashed this back and forth, back and forth, and we said, cast it in bronze. <laughs> cast that <Yeah. laughs> and have it printed. So we did. And Canada, they had a connection fit. And they said, 
basically they said, if you put that plaque up, we're going to grind our name off the bottom of that plaque. Oh, yeah. So the text goes through, and then at the bottom of them, it's uh, something like a partnership between all the First Nations, the city of Belleville, and the federal government of Canada. The government of Canada. And so we said, well, you know, the, the date was coming up on us for the <laughs> celebration. It was fixed in stone. In fact, I said, let's have it August 6th, whatever, 2010, because the treaty was signed August 6th in 1860. So, so there we are. Now we've got a, tech, uh, a plaque with a term that Canada is adamant about. And so anyway, a number of you were there. And that plaque was unveiled and it had the name Government of Canada. And we still have that plaque here. It's ground off the bottom of that plaque. And if you go down there now, there's another plaque that Canada rewrote. I couldn't go back. I've never looked at that plaque since. I've never even been down there ever since that happened. But that's how ruthless Canada can be. They took offense to the word loyalist refugee. They ground the name off that plaque. We were all there shaking hands with the mayor and Rick Norlock, our MP, was shaking hands with Chief Jim Bob and he did and I said over at the Le Learning Center one day, I said, hey, blow up that photograph. And, I said, and there's Rick Norlock smiling and, and the name uh, Government of Canada is ground off the bottom of that plaque. He didn't even know that, actually. So that's just an example of how governments can be when it comes to uh, the writing of history, when it comes to the interpretation of history. Canada was afraid that it would offend the people of Belgium. So, where does that leave us today? Today, we are in the federal court of Canada. Uh, we are defending uh, ourselves. We are, actually, we've sued Canada uh, regarding the Williams Treaty. And Canada is the defendant. Ontario was a third party to that lawsuit. And uh, Ontario has a, a, a mandate to negotiate. They've had a mandate for about three years. Canada doesn't have a mandate and it won't get a mandate. It refuses to go to cabinet. Cabinet will refuse a mandate. Cabinet is going to hold our feet to the fire and they will see us starve in court uh, through this William Treaty trial. Um, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, uh, they are breathing down our necks and they are uh, endeavoring to take a certain aspect of this trial to the Supreme Court of Canada. So here we are again, uh, from 1994-1995, the Howard case, the Williams Treaty case went to the Supreme Court. Here we are 15, 20 years later, and we it feels like we're right back to square one. Uh, but Canada uh, refuses to uh, acquire a mandate to negotiate the treaty, and so or to, to negotiate the claim. So we are going to be in court um, for years, I'm sure. Uh, Canada set aside the federal court, the room, the actual trial room, for eight months over a length of time, and uh, at that. I'm sure when the trial is over, whatever comes down, Canada will appeal it. And they'll appeal it, and they'll appeal it until it goes back to the Supreme Court, possibly. So that's what we go through in some cases to defend our history in this land. And there's somewhat of between seven and 800 claims across Canada, First Nations claims across Canada. So uh, it's really sort of a depressing situation to be in. But what comes out of it is a new, uh, what comes out of it is a complete new story regarding our place in this, in this land and our history. The history that was once at this level is now up here. So the documented history is phenomenal what, what has come out of, out, out, out of this trial. So hopefully, with any luck, uh, we'll see a new history book written out of the trial. Even if we lose the trial, we'll see a new history book written. So here's John Sunday. This is actually one of the best. This is probably as close to John Sunday as you can imagine. I don't think I'd want to be him in a back alley. <laughs> and here is some of the original.
totems, original totems, put down in the hand of our own war chiefs and warriors in 1856. Um, the deer, the reindeer, factored in as one of the prevalent totems clans here in, in Alderville, the Mississaugas of the Bay of Quinney were primarily reindeer. Uh, reindeer on the left and the second from the left, they're all reindeer for the most part except the third or the second from the right is uh, a pigeon. Uh, and I'm not sure what the small one is, but the, the prevalent totem in, in Alderville and the, and the Bay of Quinney was and um, that's all I have. Thanks for what I did. The commission came here uh, actually on the date today. Uh, September 26th. Yeah. September 26th. Isn't that amazing? Yesterday, yesterday they were in Hiawatha or Scuba. Hiawatha. Yes, uh, tomorrow is the 27th. Is how many years would that be now? September 27th, 1923, the Williams Commission came to Alderville. So the anniversary of their coming here is tomorrow, actually. How many years is that, Tim? Figure that out. I can't figure it out. 91 years or something like that. So the treaty was put down, came back. They came back in November. It was signed. And our people didn't see a copy of the treaty for eight years. Eight years. That's ridiculous. In fact, when some of the civil servants were asked for a copy of the treaty, they said, well, there, wasn't, there isn't a copy of the treaty. That copy doesn't exist, actually. So I mentioned the Royal Proclamation to set out the process of treaty making very, very distinctly. It was very, very carefully written out what that process should be. That process was never followed. So yeah, eight years it took. I have a mosquito around my head here. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and so that's, that's the kind of knowledge we would never have found out if we hadn't taken the government to court. Um, the years that it takes to research through the archives has unearthed all this fascinating, sad material, but still quite fascinating. Okay. Yep. Thanks, John. Thanks again, Dave. Councillor Moe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for coming today.